Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to go over our brain models. So what we're going to identify is some of the uh, different lobes of the brain, some of the uh, particular regions that are found in the brain, and what their function is. Um, we're also uh, going to go over some of the deep, uh, deep um, structures of the brain and go over um, the production of cerebrospinal fluid, where cerebrospinal fluid um, travels, and uh, where it gets um, drained into the, um, within the um, venous system. And so the first model that I want to start off with is our colored brain model here. And the way this model is uh, shown so on this side, they're basically showing like the main lobes, and then on this side, they're showing the particular um, regions of the brain model. So the naming of the different lobes of the brain is similar to what's in the skull. So let's identify some of them. So this here is the frontal lobe, which includes this red portion. And then this part here in the blue, this is the parietal lobe. And then here on the back side, we have the occipital lobe. Here on the side, we have the temporal lobe. And then if I pick it up, you can see the cerebellum. So this portion right here, this is where the cerebellum is. Looking at it um, this way, this here is where the brain stem is, and we'll identify the particular parts. And what's here in white, these are the cranial nerves. So cranial nerve, cranial nerve, and then that's what's coming here off of the brainstem. So we're not going to focus on this lecture on identifying all of the different cranial nerves, but generally speaking, the way that um, you identify them is basically going in numerical order. So for instance, this is one, um, this is two, and then so on as you work your way um, down. So this is something that uh, we will do um, next week. <coughs> but um, now what I want to go over is some of the particular regions here. I'm going to actually use this one. This one's better. So here at the top, this is the corpus callosum. This is the cingulate gyrus. So the cingulate gyrus is a component of the um, limbic system. So then what's here, this is where the thalamus is. So the thalamus is a component of a region of the brain, which is, which is what we know as the diencephalon. So you have the um, hypothal or the thalamus here. The hypothalamus is found here, and then the epithalamus is found uh, here, where this um, part here in, in pink is. So that's what makes up the diencephalon. This is where the midbrain is. So you have the midbrain, the pons, and then the medulla oblongata, or just the, for short, just we just say the medulla. And so these structures here. This is what makes up the brainstem. And what you can also see, uh, this here is the cerebellum. So the, the cerebellum is um, what's responsible for coordinating um, smooth, controlled uh, movement. OK, so those are the main um, parts here of our colored brain model. So now what we want to go over is some of the uh, particular regions and what their um, func function is. So this part is the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, this is, where the, this is where thinking happens. So you have the prefrontal cortex. And then um, two of the main ones, so here in red, let me turn it this way. So here in red, this is the precentral gyri. And then in blue, this is the postcentral gyri. So let me explain to you what I mean. Let me break those words apart. So what gyri is, that's the elevated part here on the brain. So these are the, the gyri. And then the reason they say it's precentral versus postcentral is based off of the central sulcus. So the central sulcus is here, which is what's dividing both of them. So that's why this one is the precentral gyri, and this is the postcentral gyri. So the function of the precentral gyri it's the primary motor cortex. So when we say motor, what are we um, discussing there? What does that mean? What does motor mean? The direction in which what? 
the direction of the neural impulse. Right? So if it's motor, it's going away from the central nervous system. If it's sensory, it's going towards the central nervous system. So the cell bodies of neurons are found here within the precentral gyri at the cerebral cortex. So we're going to identify the cerebral cortex in our other brain model, but I want to um, yeah, point that out as far as like the function. So then this is the postcentral gyri and the function is the primary somatosensory. So it's the primary somatosensory um, cortex. So what that means is we're referring to sensory, referring to sensation. So for me to touch the table, um, for me to feel pain like in my hand, all of those, um, those neurons are going to, they'll synapse here within the cerebral cortex of this particular region of the brain. Okay, so then um, let's look at some of the other particular structures. So here on the side, this is the primary auditory cortex, so that's where 34 is, and then 35 is the auditory um, association. And then if I look at the brain here, and I show you from this point of view, this is the primary visual cortex where number um, 36 is. So this is for, for vision. Okay, so primary visual cortex. So the next one, a couple of regions. So starting over here, this is a region which is known as um, Broca's area. So you have Broca's and Wernicke's area. Both of these are um, associated with speech, but they're different. So for Broca's, Broca's is for speech production. This means that it's motor. Wernicke's is for understanding speech or interpreting speech. So this is more of a sensory function. So when you talk to me, I'm using Wernicke's. Right now, I'm using Broca's area for me to speak. So once again, Broca's area is here where 31 is, and then Wernicke's area is here at 27. So now some of the other particular ones. So 32, this is where the writing area is. And then 33, this is where the um, premotor cortex is. So when I say premotor cortex, what I'm referring to is the planning of our movements, right? Because um, the primary motor, this is for executing those movements. So for me to move my arm, for me to contract my bicep, neurons are going to start here and the signal will go down through the spinal cord. So and once again we're going to like once we go over like the spinal cord and the details of that we'll start to learn like the tracks and everything and how the signal um, goes through the spinal cord out through the spinal nerve and how they um, synapse with each other okay but right now we're just focusing on the brain itself. Okay. So now that we've finished our colored brain model, the next one we want to go to is the detachable brain model. So if we look at it here, this is from the front. The lobes are still similar, right? Frontal, parietal, occipital. And so I'm going to take the lobes off here of this brain, off the, the top part. And let me, I can show you this way. So if you look at it here, you have white matter and gray matter that's um, found within the brain. So the white matter is the part that's here on the inside. So all of this is white matter, and the part that's here on the outside, this is the gray matter. So what, get, what makes the white matter white is the myelin sheath that wraps around the axons. If we have bundles of myelinated axons within the central nervous system, what is the term that we use to describe this? We call them tracks yes they are tracks so this is where tracks are found here and they're also found in the spinal cord so then on the outside this is where the cerebral cortex is so here within the cerebral cortex once again this is the prefrontal cortex where all thinking happens where your thinking happens and so here at the cerebral cortex where the cell bodies of the neurons are this is where 
thinking happens, or it's th where thinking happens, but this is where your memories are stored. So they're stored within the cell body. So if you think about it, this is helping you with problem solving. So let's say I'm trying to tackle a new problem. Well, the memories that are stored here, stuff that I have already learned, I will use that information to solve a new problem. Okay. So now let's look at this. So this structure is what we know as the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum connects the right and the left halves of the brain. So this is a um, superior view. And if we look at it from, let's look at it at this brain model. So if we look at this brain model, this here is the corpus callosum, but this is a mid-sagittal view. Okay. So back to this. So the part that you see here, that's here on the side, this is what's known as the internal capsule. So this is where a bunch of tracks will be found here at the internal capsule. <coughs> so then I'm going to take this off as well as the corpus callosum and let's get a better view of this. So I'm taking off, this is the cerebellum here. And what I want to show you, I've already mentioned that what this part is here, but now let's look at this. So this is what's known as the insula. So you have the insula and you can take the insula off You take the insula off on both sides. And let's look at some of the deep structures. So these structures that I'm going to go over, this is what's part of the um, basal, what we know as the basal nuclei. Okay, so what the basal nuclei, it helps to, it's also involved with movement. And so diseases um, found uh, within this particular region of the brain uh, one example is what we know as um, Parkinson's. It's a movement disorder. Okay, so let's identify some of this stuff. So this part is what we know as the caudate nucleus. Caudate is Latin for tail. Um, this part is known as the putamen. And then if you look on this side, this is what we know as the globus pallidus. So globus pallidus, what that means is pale ball. Okay, and then once again, this here is the internal um, capsule. Okay, so now that I have, I've shown some of the deep structures here, another thing I want to point out is um, this particular structure. So the brain model, so this region sits like this. So once again, we orient ourselves, see what it is that we are looking at. So if you look at it, this particular part, this is what we know as the fornix. So the fornix is what connects the, uh, it connects to this part. Let me show you on here. So if I take this brain model off and I take, so these are the ventricles. I'm going to take the ventricles off as well so you can see it. So it's, see this part here in green? So the fornix is what's connecting, this is the mammillary bodies here. So if I put this back together, you can see the mammillary bodies that are there in green. Okay, so back to this. So this was the fornix, and then this part in red, this is the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus, this is where cerebrospinal fluid is produced. And we'll discuss more about that here in a little bit. But this part here on the outside, this is what's known as the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a component of the limbic system, and the limbic system is what helps with um, emotion, uh, learning, and also with um, memory. It's associated with those. Okay. So now I have um, this brain model, and uh, what I wanted to show you is how this sits within the skull. So this here, if you look at it from this top, this is what we know as the foramen magnum. So this part, which is the medulla oblongata, is the part that's going to travel out, coming this way, what travels through it. Okay, so let's look at 
We've already talked about the brainstem, but let's look at some of the um, particular regions. So if we look at it from the back, from the back side, from a posterior view, this is the midbrain, and this is what we know as the corpora quadrimina. So for the corpora quadrimina, you have the superior and inferior colliculi. So the top one is responsible for our visual reflex, and the bottom is for auditory um, reflex. And then if you look at both of these structures here, this is where the thalamus is found. So this is the thalamus, and then once again the thalamus is here, hypothalamus is there, and the um, pineal gland is here. So the pineal gland, that's what secretes um, what we know as melatonin. Melatonin helps to regulate our sleep cycle. But the hypothalamus, this is what helps to control the secretion of our, um, of our hormones. So it helps with, within the endocrine system to regulate that. And then if you look at it um, here once again, so this was the midbrain, and then this is the pons, and then the medulla is the part here that's on the, on the bottom. And one thing to mention about the thalamus is that the thalamus functioned as a relay station because all of the tracks, right, they're going to be traveling through here to get to the different um, particular regions of the brain. And so some of these um, lower areas of the brain, they're helping, you know, within the brainstem. This is helping for, um, with what we know is like, like heart rate, you know, respiratory, like just respiration. Um, like what I mean is like breathing and um, some of these um, basic functions. Okay, so with that being said, that's what's going to um, lead us to the next topic, which is the passage of the cranial nerves. So we need to talk about um, where these cranial nerves pass through within our skull. So I've already showed you know, how it sits in the skull, but then um, this is cranial nerve number two, and then cranial nerve number one is found here. So if we look at the skull again, so cranial nerve one, which is olfactory, this is what's helping with smell, it sits like this here in the skull. So the function of this one, it's for smell, but the part where its synapses, where it's found at, is here within the cribriform plate. So this here is the, the cribriform plate. So that's cranial nerve one. Cranial nerve two, which is the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is what, because it it's like, sits like this. So the optic canal is this part that's in purple. So that's cranial nerve number two. So then um, cranial nerves three through six, these are, most of them are responsible for the motor um, component. So just movement of the eye. And so all of these that are responsible for movement of the eye, this is what's going to travel through the superior orbital fissure. So you can see the superior orbital fissure coming through um, this pink part, this pink washer, so um, this pipe cleaner. So you can see it there uh, from the top. I'll bring it closer towards the camera. So yeah, so that's um, three through six. The next one is seven, which is the um, facial. So the facial nerve is here in blue, and it's coming from the stylomastoid foramen. So this is the styloid process, this is the mastoid process, so this is right next to it. So that's why they call it the stylomastoid um, foramen. Okay, so that was um, facial. The next one is the vestibulocochlear. So the vestibulocochlear is what's responsible for um, hearing and um, for balance. So we've already identified the external acoustic meatus, which is here on the outside, but then on the inside where the green, so I'll put the green part here, that is the internal acoustic meatus. So you can look at it from here. So that's the internal acoustic meatus where um, the vestibulocochlear nerve is traveling through. Okay, so after the vestibulocochlear, we have nine through 11 which these cranial nerves are passing through the jugular foramen. So the jugular foramen is what's here in orange. So that's this part. And then if you look at it from an inferior view, you can also see it right there. 
Okay, so then the last one is the hypoglossal nerve. So the hypoglossal nerve is what's here in yellow. So you can see it there. You can see it coming from the side, or from the bottom, and then an inferior view this way. Okay. So that'll do it for that. Okay. So the next topic that we need to discuss is the, first of all, the formation of cerebrospinal fluid, where it's made, and how it gets to the venous system and how it circulates. So the ventricles sit in the brain like this. So now that we know it, what it is that we are looking at, let's identify um, some of the different structures. <clears throat> but before I like talk about how it circulates within this and like go over some of the anatomy, I wanna show you the torso model and how it gets into the venous system. So, when it gets, when I say getting to the venous system, what I'm saying is we're trying to get it to the heart. Okay, and so in order for us to get this fluid into the heart, it has to get into this part. So this is what's known as the internal jugular vein. So the internal jugular vein is what comes down and that's what um, leads to get into the heart. Okay, so let's figure out how does cerebrospinal fluid eventually drain into here? So what I want to show you on this half head model, so this is where the choroid plexus is. So CSF is produced here, and then it's going to travel through the ventricle system. It travels through the ventricle system, and then it eventually gets to this part, which is what's known as the subarachnoid space. Once you get to the subarachnoid space, it then gets into these red dots. So these red dots, this is what's known as the arachnoid um, granulations. Okay, so we know that, and then we're gonna go back to the torso and see how it circulates, but let's refer to the ventricles. Okay, so looking at it from an anterior view, both of these, these are the lateral ventricles. This is the third ventricle, and then this here on the bottom, this is the fourth ventricle. This part here at the very bottom, this is what we know as the central canal. So the central canal is what travels all the way through the, the middle of the spinal cord. Okay, so how do we get from one ventricle to the next? So for this one, you have the inner ventricular foramina. From the third to the fourth, it travels through the cerebral aqueduct and then it'll continue to flow until it gets to the lateral apertures. So these are the lateral apertures, and this is the median aperture. Some of the other particular regions, you have the anterior horns here in the front, the posterior horns on the back, and on here at the bottom, these are the inferior horns. And so if you remember what we, what we talked about today, what lines the ventricles? What type of cells? starts with an E, the, epin, the ependymal cells. Yeah, so the ependymal cells, that's what lines the ventricles where cerebrospinal fluid is circulating. Okay, so now we've identified this, we can refer back to our head model. So it's come, once again, it's coming down and then it's getting through the subarachnoid space into the arachnoid granulations and into this particular part which is what we know as the superior sagittal sinus. So it's traveling here in the superior sagittal sinus, and then it eventually leads to um, this particular um, region. So this is what's known as the confluence of sinuses. And so when we say the confluence of sinuses, so not only is CSF circulating through the superior sagittal sinus, it's also traveling through other particular regions. So if we look at here at the top where um, number 11 is, this is the inferior sagittal sinus because the superior is on top. 
So then this converges to this point, and then if I turn it this way, you can see this is where the straight sinus is. So CSF is coming through here, coming through here, and then it reaches to this point, which is what I said earlier, the confluence of sinuses. So then once it gets to this point, it travels transverse. So it goes through the transverse sinus, which would be seen here, coming this way. And then from there, it goes into the sigmoid sinus. Once we reach the sigmoid sinus, which is shaped like an S, we then finally reach our final destination, which was the internal jugular vein. All right. Well, do you have any questions for me? No? Okay, so that's going to do it for this lecture.